thought yesterday at that moment when Jessica and um, Robbie were up here talking about Teeny Town. At that moment, we were having a bit of a you know, technical issue. So I thought this morning as we introduced Alyssa Solomon and Robbie for their conversation, we would just go through these few slides so you can see them. Um, and I want Robbie to call out, and Alyssa too if you would like to, um, about this piece here. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very early with the band. Uh, sedition Ensemble, we were called. The political band. And we were doing a piece called The History of the Universe for Those Who What? Privilege to be here. Um, I've been 
Baruch Heavy as well. Um, it's been incredibly moving um, and exciting and I've been learning so much, thinking about so much. Um, and there are a lot of threads I thought we could pick up from yesterday that I'd like to ask you about. Um, but I'm going to start, like, I, I have things planned, but just seeing those slides, I, I'm going to start somewhere else than, than I planned because one of the things striking just about a few images in there is the physicality um, in your work. Um, the, the use of your body, your movement, the expressiveness of it. And then I always notice how, you know, how erect your posture is and how calmly <laughs> you have this kind of sort of wise posture. <laughs> that I admire that you know that you kind of hold stage even in your stillness um, that way and I wonder if you could you could talk a little bit about how you think about using uh, over the years you've thought about using movement in your work and how you prepared to do that like did you have any physical training I've been accused of being a choreographer <laughs> and a dancer and a singer, um, which are, I've had no training in any of those things. Um, but I worked with Chaikin, Joseph Chaikin, the director, whose name I've mentioned a few times. That many of you may know or not, that he was um, a signature figure in the experimental theater uh, work in New York in the 60s and 70s until he passed um, early in, in uh, the century. I think it was Chapman um, But, um, his work had to do with using the body. And they had done some, I, I was not a member of the Open Theater, which was his theater, but I uh, came in to work in a play. Which play was it? Um, a movie star has to star in black and white by Adrian Kennedy, that was mentioned. And I saw how the actors were working from kind of an internal sense of the body. And I thought, well, maybe I should try some of that. And, um, and I wasn't quite, I didn't know the language of, of the work. But um, Joe gave me a recording of Marian Anderson's singing opera. And he told me that I had sources. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back to rehearsal and started going from the inside of my body out. And I didn't even realize that I was doing that until years later um, when this person Tara Watkins wrote about my work and she talked about um, my use of the body from the inside out. Was, it's really hard to talk about um, how I work and who, what the training was and then how I began to do that. Chris and Lincoln was the voice work which had to do with the voice in the body. But for me, um, the, the language of, of the work strikes my imagination. So I think body, body and voice, how does that work? And so since then, I've been experimenting with, with being present in the body while I'm working. I don't know if any of that makes sense. 
Yeah, it does. I'm like, um, so do you, when you're working on something, do you improvise physically? Or, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> things that I teach, you know, I learn from teaching. And so, um, I will ask the students to imagine the insides of their bodies from what you know about the body. And so if you imagine the shapes of your organs, or, your, or the structure of your body, you can begin to put breath and thought throughout your body. And when you're working with material, with text, you can begin to connect the text to what you're saying. So, you know, that's just the strenuousness and I, if I'm going to teach it, then I have to do it on my own. So that's how that process started. You know, shaping that process that was early on felt like I'm not sure what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And later it started to be, well, this is a way of shaping words through the body. So that, in the slides we saw yesterday from, from Sugar, we saw that quite uh, externalized in the slides with the, the blood cells, oh, the yeah. beating heart, and so on. And would you say that you know, when you're thinking about, about the inside of your body <coughs> as a piece of how you're bringing forth the performance, that it's, that it's, that, that it's even cellular like that? Yeah, I mean, those were, um, yeah, that amazing. Images. And those were my actual heart because of mm -hmm. that work that I had to you know, get done on my own. And, and Amir took those those pictures and made them into the heart. Um, but I do think as the teacher it's possible. So I mean, to me, the mystery of the work happens because you do the obvious instruction. If you work with the body, then continue to investigate the body. If you're working with language, continue to investigate everything that language can do. You know, and shape. articulate or not. And so that's just, um, and I think each performer um, makes up their own relationship to space, time, body, and language. There's a, there's a way in which you think and I, and I think you've used this word before, talking about language and voice on stage. It's orca it feels orchestrated, you know. Um, it's paced, it's modulated, it's... Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you, how you came to that. I don't know if, it, if it's related to the work in Sedition Ensemble and working in jazz idioms with music, um, but how you, um, how you thought about language and vocalization in almost musical terms. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no theater to me without music. Woo. Yeah. And whether, you know, instruments or what, but language is music. Um, time is music. And so, 
and we all know that rhythm is theater. Um, and working with band, um, you know, I loved at that. <laughs> I mean, down to the point of saying, when you arrive at the venue, you say, I'm with the band. <laughs> <laughs> just had the luxury of, of exploring all these things we're talking about in terms of music. And, uh, and Ed, Ed Montgomery, who was uh, my partner, my mutual husband, um, <coughs> called that group a theater band. And that was some good tension between us because I'm not a musician and he wasn't a theater person. But I, I thought that that helped to what we created. And that, that was before, I'm sort of jumping all around in the order I had here, but uh, that, that, that was work before you kind of emerged with uh, with pieces about your own family history. Um, so and so for people who weren't familiar with that earlier work, was Tradition Ensemble, can you describe a little bit of like the kinds of things you'd be talking about um, in those performances? Yeah. Um, the earlier work was again about um, the pol political work, mm -hmm. sedition work. Um, and the piece of history of the universe uh, started off talking about uh, that the universe started with in 1968 with the murder of Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. and we looked at that incident as a breaking open of the lessons on um, the violence. American imperialism, because Fred Hampton was such a great teacher in terms of politics. And we barely know him because he was killed at 21 um, by police. And that's such a, uh, a dramatic story. And why don't we even tell that story? I mean, it's an American drama I felt uh, needed much more of our stories, and thank goodness that has, you know, continues to change and always was there. But how well did we know our stories? And so that image uh, opened up uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of language around telling those stories uh, of uh, racist imperialism uh, and, and using rhetoric wanting to use rhetoric uh, in, with the music and with the, the drama, uh, you know, just making it more possible to have those stories in the air. Was that scripted or did you improvise based on a, like a template? No, we scripted it. We got texts from newspapers from you know, found text and um, mainly found text and um, imp improvisation in between. So that was the beginning of writing out of the polemic. Because I, I also knew that deep down you can't beat people up the head with politics. And, <laughs> At least that's what everybody says. <laughs> uh, and so in the in, inside dialogue, I was thinking, hmm, what about the real stories, the personal stories? And, uh, and talking about war, 
I went back to my father. And the first one that I did was um, a story with Bob Carroll, who I'm sure nobody in this room knows. But Bob Carroll was a performance artist who did something called um, The Salmon Show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and he asked me and Ed, the two of us, to do a show he was calling The Dirt Show. And my piece of dirt was the dirt on my feet from Georgia that built into San Juan Hill, where my grandfather was in the 10th Cavalry of the Buffalo Soldier. And I thought, boy, everybody I bet you has, has, a, has a, a family story. You know, I'm real late on that. I mean, <laughs> Oedipus, you know. They all started with family story. But, um, but so, you know, I went from there to this huge image because, and now I do an exercise called What War Were You Born Into? Because yeah. every, we got another one starting today. So war became strong. Uh -huh. And then I did My Father and the War. So let me ask you, uh, use a question that you posed to colleagues yesterday about that. How, how did you step into a place where you needed to say something that hadn't been said? What, what enabled you to make that, that transition? Well, I, I guess it's kind of what I just said. But um, for me personally, it was that I I hadn't properly mourned my father. Um, I had a lot of tension with him. And uh, when I, I had to, from the inside, um, tell that story, but I didn't want to, you know, indulge and tell all the business and all that. So I put it in the context of black men and war. Mm -hmm. um, and felt like I had to step into the light to tell that story. I think there's a line about um, the men in your family being in you know, some kind of Army or Navy or Air Force, yeah. and the, the image of the uniform, <coughs> the idea of the uniform being very important. Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's as many of us know, um, that that was the, one of the survival jobs, whether they survived or not, for our families. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in my family, I mean, we were ordinary people were uh, in recent peace I were, we were, we were working middle class and working middle class people had to work <laughs> and often because of job and situation and so forth a good job for a man was to be I loved Karen's speech yesterday that had another aspect of that. So what, how did you find fear? What, like her war, how did it find you? What made you? Oh, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a true story. Um, when I was at Howard University, a wonderful theater um, I, w I was 
searching always for, you know, who am I and what I want to do in the Lord. And um, what opened a big door <laughs> on the campus and what onto the stage. It was the stage door and they were bringing things in. And I walked onto the stage and Owen Dotson uh, was out there directing uh, uh, Medea. And, and he said, who are you? And I said, I just walked in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the perfect metaphor. <laughs> and he said, well, can you act? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, we just lost the chorus leader, so you're going to be it. <laughs> and it was natural for me. So I felt like, and then that to me brings up the question of, you know, talent or, or mm -hmm. study, mm -hmm. and it's both, of course. Mm -hmm. But I think that was, I felt, when I walked on that stage, I felt like, that's, this is where I belong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I was up to go as a, you know, second year at Howard, and I signed up for theater made it my second major. And what was your first major? History. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's, it's a great story. <laughs> That's how it happened. And Owen Dotson was somebody was ringing the bell for the Owen Dotson. He was a character. Yeah. And So one thing that came up, one of the many things that came up yesterday that I wanted to go back to today was um, the idea of dreams. Um, Carl read that beautiful passage from um, Sishu saying, you know, we should write as we dream. And I know you've, you've talked about um, <coughs> being inspired by dreams of ancestors appearing in your dreams and uh, uh, instigating work for you. Could, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the role of mm. those images yeah, um, the main one, the significant one for me was, um, and I say it in the script, she came to me in a dream, uh, was my great-great-grandmother, Sally. Um, and I always had an image of an auction block. I used to like in performance to stand on a block. And for me, the block was, you know, the, the, um, the way you do polemic mm -hmm. and you talk to the people. But for me, the, every time standing up on a block on stage, all I could think of was the auction block. And in this dream, I heard her voice, and, and I can still hear the sound of her voice. And she said, tell it, tell it, tell it, if you can tell it, tell it, tell it. And I woke up and started writing. And that was when I knew, you know, it was one of those things that Adrian Kennedy talks about place pouring out of her. Mm -hmm. And Salisbury poured out, you know, because I shaped it and edited it, but it poured out. Was it a surprise to you? Well, in the process, you're just doing it. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, to me, it was, I put it on the page. I, I thought of the shape of it, but it wasn't quite all there. Uh, but I didn't think of it as, as anything particularly special because 
It was given to me and I put it down. Uh, and it was only when, when I started to see it and talk about it that I, that I thought it was something not quite worthwhile. Can we talk a little bit about the, the evolution of it? You mentioned yesterday that you had worked on Sally Sarif at first as a solo piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jeannie Hutchins came into it. Um, and you know, it was still your piece um, that she was in. Uh, but but the, the relationship on stage and the way, at least as a white person in the audience, she's a kind of uh, stand-in or triangulating figure, um, I think is very important. Um, and it's, you know, it's also that, I guess it was Sophocles who brought the second actor into, okay. you know, for uh, Hermetic <laughs> Unity. Yeah. Uh, since, 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 since you mentioned Oedipus, yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, so can, can you tell us a little bit about the process of development and at what point it, it became clear to you that having some dialogic uh, action on the stage was going to be important for the piece? Well, in the piece, I was talking to a character named Janie. And I did it. I think <coughs> I only did it twice so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I took off my dress the first time. I said I would take you know how I, in the piece, I talk about the theatrics of the moment. Right? At this point, I would take off my dress. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking to Janie, I said. And then I did it at um, a woman's, which I mentioned yesterday, a woman's theater conference at NYU. And um, I did it. I took off my dress, and, uh, and Jesse was eight years old in the audience. Oh. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I did it solo, and at the end of it, um, when I walked out, there, Glenda Dickerson, um, Sidney Mahone, um, just a, 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 a whole um, crew of black women were just standing out, embracing me. And um, they said, but who are you talking to? That was what I heard. All kinds of things were coming to my ear. Mm -hmm. um, but who are you talking to? And uh. I thought I was talking to black women. But when I was doing the performance, Janie to me was a white woman. And how are we different? So, I saw Jeannie walking down the street <laughs> on the Lower East Side. And I said, are you doing anything? And she said, no. And I said, I'm, I'm doing a piece and I want you to be in it. And I'd seen her do performance. He's sitting silently on alone on the stage, and I thought I'd just talk to her <laughs> on the stage. But um, when she got there, we'd have conversations, and then I'd go off with my team. So that was how that. And we'd have tea. So it starts at And I brought in. Jessica once and Lori once to look at it. And they said, go, Jessica. 
advised me not to have the fight scene because it wasn't, to me, it, it's not a fight scene. It's not like who wins in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica told me that. Lori told me not to have Jessica, uh, not to have Sheenie take off her dress because we're different. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she has the choice in a way. Right, right? she does have the choice. Yeah. <coughs> it's a very powerful moment um, that I remember also from, I guess from 26 years ago, Yeah, was it? That um, uh, you asked her to mm -hmm. also go on the block right. and she she can't do it, or she doesn't. She doesn't have to do it. She doesn't. She pulls down. One of the things uh, about about that show, and uh, really all of the others, um, I think was uh, characterized well by Kim Moore yesterday when she said that part of part of how you. Know, you, you function in your work is that you look back at the, it's not just the audience looking at you. You're, you're looking back at the audience, you're engaging the audience in a, in a very direct way. Um, what, what do you see when you look at the audience? I see, I mean, this is what came to me, and this is the truth. I see my mother, and by that I mean everyone looking at me are people that I want to, to explain to you to. Because my mother and I, my mother was very smart, and from that generation that covered up her smartness. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have these kinds, kind, kinds of conversations with her. And every once in a while, she'd come out with something just on point. But I wanted to have these kinds of you never, you've made work about men in your family, but I don't think you ever. Well, Sally's right. Yeah, well, about, yeah about and that was like also yeah. um, something that I thought about after a while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah. So you've also, you know, you, you've also talked about, I, even from within work, the, the Kind of role of the audience after the show's over that um, that you're making work that specifically is um, igniting something. It's not it's not over, you know, <laughs> with the curtain call. You, you know, it's, it's something's supposed to continue. Something's opened up by the show. Um, what? How uncomfortable can you make an audience? You know, and, and still keep them in it, but create the discomfort. If you know, and I think that's part of what's necessary for the conversation to continue, maybe I'm wrong. Um, well, Cindy, I think, pointed out that I feed the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I often have food, and that's the way. Keep people in the theater. <laughs> Chart stuff. Um, and that trust the audience. Trust the audience. Yes. I think if the audience is there, mm -hmm. they will be there. Mm -hmm. And like we said, some people walk out, but I don't think they. They, whatever they heard, they have to carry with them yeah. and, and, and process, you know, what it was that they walked out from. Mm -hmm. So that's why. But I, I 
trust the audience to take it in like it or not, mm -hmm. and to <coughs> and to continue the conversation. If people actually do as Peter Brook you know, says, they go and sleep through it and walk out. I'm not interested. Um, but I, I I trust the audience. Doesn't matter if they're trustworthy. It's just that I bring that far. Hopefully, maybe that's that's part of. I'm not sure which is the chicken or the egg, but the there's some your vulnerability on stage can be very disarming for an audience. I think in a productive way, but maybe you're you're able to present that because you trust them a priori. Mm -hmm. And I recognize it's a dangerous place right. up here to, to be vulnerable in front of people. But again, as we talked about last night, you walk into that. That's part of the work, stepping into that place where you're going to be vulnerable. And it's never easy. But you know, it's like diving into deep water, which is a any child who is, because I'm not a great swimmer. So, but I know that there's a lifeguard. What is the lifeguard on stage? <laughs> material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going to play the material. And the urgency of the material. Yeah. So how do you prepare yourself? I mean, you said yesterday, you said it kind of was a joke, but that, you know, nervousness was hell. Um, you know, how do you prepare yourself? I mean, the material is difficult, and um, it's traumatic, a lot of it. How do, you, how do you prepare yourself to take that dive, and then how do you recover each night? Mm. I remember Trezana Beverly, who did the first Lady in Red, mm -hmm. in the Color Girls, would, after a show, she wouldn't see anybody. She would go in her dressing room and recover from that role, um, which I also did, but I could leave it, but I left the stage. I would leave that on the stage. If I ask the audience to talk to each other or <coughs> hope that they carry it with them, then <laughs> good, <laughs> you know, have your own <laughs> angst about it, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so that's, that's, no, I'm, to me there's the entrance, the being, um, how do I prepare? I go back. We know when I'm so nervous. I get, and I try to remember and I teach this, but you have to go to it each time. I go to this kind of almost mantra. I know more about what I'm going to do than anybody else in the world. So that actually, so let's talk about masks. Um, in a way that's a, you know, it, it's true. But, it came up, the idea of masks came up yesterday a couple of times. Um, Daniel talked about um, you directing him and, and, and how you, um, uh, you confronted him and, and, and in a way that made him take his mask down. Um, and you talked about Teeny Town, you and Jessica talked about the, the kind of mask of minstrelsy. Um, and I remember <coughs> way back um, when the infamous um, uh, Robert Bruce Dean, August Wilson debate, um, and, uh, and, all. Um, and they, you know, they were 
bumping their chests at each other and carrying on and, um, and you know, who could be in this and who could be on stage or this or that. And this voice came from the house that said, why don't we just go back to using masks in the theater? <laughs> 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 so I remembered that I remembered that yesterday when when you know this image of the mask came up um, a couple of times and 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 again when um, sorry I forgot who said it but when uh, the 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 panel of of artists who were talking about the the distance uh, between you know your real self whatever that is and the stage self in autobiographical work that, right, that, I mean, right. that's a kind of kind of mask to you but like what is the mask for you and what's its what's its importance for me the mask is the actor for me mm -hmm. um, when I'm being the actor I'm telling this part of the story because it is somebody else said yesterday that your story is not your whole story. It is that focus that you're working. I mean, you know, mm. my father was not just about the wars, you know. It was about and so um, I become the actor stepping into the space, doing the actor's work. And you know, acting and writing are different. And I thought a lot about this because when I first did My Father in the War, someone said to me, and I don't remember who, but it was at an, at an artist um, conference, um, Roots, of the Roots organization. And someone said to me, you can't play yourself. Uh. <laughs> and that's all I had to hear. Uh. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I am playing myself. But playing myself mm -hmm. is the acting work. Yeah. And I love that idea. I love, I love putting it that way, that you're playing. <laughs> and, you know, a character is not the actor. The actor becomes the character. Mm -hmm. And so if I show up and enter the space to do the work, mm -hmm. then the character emerges. So this, this work, these pieces we're making, of course, were, um, you know, coming forth at a a time where uh, autobiographical performance art was um, emerging or you know becoming more uh, of a recognized form, I guess I would say. And there's a lot of contexts in which we can place your work and understand it, but that's that's certainly one of them. Um, and I wonder how you how you place yourself, or how you see your own work in the context of other performers of your generation who were doing this kind of work, because it, it, it was very different. I remember, like, once I was assigned to, to review a piece of yours, forgive me, I don't even remember which one it was, um, along with a new piece by Spalding Gray. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was a really, uh, um, it just made something so stark, <laughs> you know, <laughs> about the difference between work that is, has no choice but to engage being in the world and work where you know you can just sit behind a table with a microphone and a spotlight on you and assume that that's where you're always belong you know um, to tell your personal um, story removed from the world to an audience um, and yet that you know that work and I, you know I don't mean to caricature it too much, and I'm certainly not saying this in any way to denigrate the work of Spalding Gray, but but just to point out a, a contrast of um, maybe maybe two poles, 
you know, of, of work that was happening at that time. Um, and like, did, did you see yourself as, as part of the same, same world that somebody like Spalding Gray was, was occupying, or were you in some other corner of it, or do you, do you, I mean, everybody has legacies, you know, we have our feet in a lot of different places where our roots, you know, are coming into to us. Was that one of them for you? Uh, no. Um, I love that article, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It was a little uncomfortable because it was soon after the Roots Golden Path. Yeah. And I liked his <coughs> presence, mm -hmm. but I was not interested in, in that in doing that. And I didn't know his work mm -hmm. at the time when I started. Um, no, I, I wanted to s say something. I wanted, I wanted, and you know, coming up uh, uh, with a term that, you know, students have heard over and over, the personal bigger story, personal story connected to something bigger. And so I wanted to use my personal voice in order to address um, things relevant to the presence of black people mm -hmm. in this world. Our stories and how our stories reflect Did you have Did you have models for that in the theater? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. I come from a legacy mm -hmm. of black people who've done that in many different ways, um, often in music, but mainly poetry and um, maybe now in literature there is some attention to the world of black poetry. <clears throat> but um, I was <coughs> fascinated with how little we knew this country about black poetry. And um, so that was my main influence, the, the oral culture the storytelling, um, the, the kinds of stories the, the, that uh, Dale was telling yesterday, you know, just the dialogue, mm -hmm. um, the kitchen table story. To me, there's a world of music um, to draw. So you've made a whole technique out of that. So what's a story circle exactly? And how does it work? Well, Oh, you were. You were I, I didn't know. I, I didn't. It wasn't able to well, me briefly, I think everybody heard or not, but John O'Neill actually uh -huh. brought that forth at this time. It's based on the, the thing that is in, um, and I'm not sure what which um, group has the source, but Native American mm -hmm. uh, passing the stick. <coughs> Kim uses this where people sit in a circle, tell stories, and then talk about what was said. And you, you use it with students? You use it in creative processes, or what's it? It's with students in creative, in directing, mm -hmm. in teaching. I mean, with students, but as a teaching mode. What does it what does it open up or what do you learn from it? Well, because people are encouraged to tell something personal and bigger. It helps people talk about things that are hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of, you know Did you have bad white people in your family? 
tell the story about <laughs> tell the story about something that surprised you. I think one of the things that's especially that, that can be very difficult when I'm put in, think of when I hear you ask that question, think about I was, one of the things I was thinking about after um, what Cindy discussed yesterday is the, the, um, the particular, particular difficulty of opening the conversation within white liberalism that for, for families, you know, that didn't have clan members or something, you know, something that's stark, uh, which is, um, which, you know, obviously needs to be discussed in, in Cindy's book was, I think, really an important um, intervention. Um, but when, when there isn't that particular history in a family, um, may be harder to get people mm -hmm. to discuss, to recognize, to um, own mm -hmm. uh, participation in racist structures. Um, and I, I wonder if those, that story circle kind of prompt or other, or performance itself gets, you know, gets underneath those questions. So. This is, it's such a, uh, I'm, it, I'm doing this because it's so hard to get hold of mm -hmm. um, this business of how do you transform people's sense of race as Injury to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, usually for 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 many black people, you know, we and I'm sometimes the same, just kind of done with it. Mm -hmm. And it's a white people problem, so yep. <laughs> <laughs> let them let them figure it out. Um, and that may be where we are now because there's a, every um, you know forty years or so there's a bit of change, a bit of. And right now, um, there seems to be a bit of movement right now. And I think artists make a difference because we're usually ahead of that. We're mm -hmm. a couple of steps ahead. Um, but I don't have the answer. If I would, I would. Mm -hmm. But what are the, I mean, you've talked about the need to tell the untellable stories. So what are the untellable stories right now in this, you know, horrendous moment? Um, I think the untellable stories are why didn't you tell your children why you live where you live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are we out of time? Well, yeah. I, I think that's a really important place for us to continue thinking about. Um, we are over time, but I love the idea that we have to sit with that. Yeah. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's great.